everyone. I know we've got people from around the world today for the Saracis Global Meet. And as we speak, I know that there are over a thousand people, business leaders, policymakers, head of states that come together to discuss this rather unusual thing that we've all witnessed in the past 16 months or 18 months. And uh, it's an honor to be here, uh, as always, with uh, Dr. Frank Richter in Horasis. And um, we have an interesting panel, which could not be more relevant. Uh, our panel for today is about remanding business models. And I wish we had our crystal ball to go through all of the aspects of that, but we'll come to that later. And um, uh, it's my honor to chair this panel. We've got a very eclectic uh set of distinguished uh, business leaders uh, and from around the world. We've got Dr. Yulian Ivanov. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Yulian, he has been a um, director of the boutique uh, group of companies, Collins Group Canada. Um, he used to run the largest technology park in the Balkans and Sofia region. And uh, he's been an advisor to the Bank of America and Fidelity Investments and, bring, and brings uh, global enriching experience. So thank you for being with us, Yulian. It's my uh, pleasure. Uh, we have Jayanta Podar from uh, Calcutta, India. He is the chairman, managing director of Decorazzi Paints. So he brings a very different manufacturing perspective to this. Uh, very accomplished business executive for two and a half decades, uh, started his entrepreneurial journey very recently and has been honored also by various forums as the India's most trusted CEO 2020. Uh, you bring some very innovative uh, ideas in your traditional line of business, so we'll, we'll come to that later. And of course, we have E. I think he's the most global yeah. <laughs> uh, person from all. I mean, uh, the, the born in China, Grew up in Canada, lived and, in uh, Europe, Germany. Germany. So, and, and, you know, living in Singapore, um, you founded Marvel Tech in 2017, I believe. Yes. And, and, uh, you've had 16 years of uh, Deutsche Telekom, uh, experience and, and your company provides, uh, uh, telecommunication providers with kind of, uh, international network demand, uh, and facilitate operator partnerships across the entire Asia Pacific, right? So, and we have Jesper, uh, again, very eclectic perspective. Jesper is the CEO and co-founder of Soundbox Denmark. And it, it Soundbox uh, works to create spaces of freedom for the youth and, and uh, through the power of music, through the power of uh, fans and was founded in 2015, right? And so, and, uh, Soundbox is about 80 employees as of now and sells across all of U.S. and uh, the uh, EU. So thank you for being with us. Thanks for we having me. we get on with, uh, with uh, Yolian. Uh, so Yolian, uh, uh, just a teaser thing for me, from my perspective, we are going to discuss how do we go from ter- you know, surviving to thriving in this COVID. And, and I have two very teaser thoughts and then we get on to the questions. One is, you know, I have never seen disruptions all across as I we've all seen. So the markets have changed, the supply chain has changed or disrupted. And the way we engage with each other and businesses has also changed. So I don't think there is anything really carry forward from the old times. Everything is under disruption. So it gives us a very good uh, backdrop to discuss uh, how do we reimagine business models. So Jolien, uh, you're in uh, Europe, and so my first question to you would be, what will be the European business model post this COVID? Europe being so such an important keg in the entire wheel. So what do you think about this, Jolien? Thank you, Niraj. Um, it's an excellent question because it's uh, related to our future, and I agree with you that uh, everything has changed uh, during the pandemic, but I believe on the base of uh, innovation, new services, transforming uh, the, the life, we can succeed. And uh, speaking for for Europe, as I mentioned during the preliminary conversation, uh, one of the priorities is a green deal. Therefore, uh, speaking about uh, the importance of the health, healthcare and the green deal, this is uh, going for better humanity. 
therefore using uh, forces to of, of change as a technology democratization and power of the uh, pool in order to to use the capacity of the human being i believe the humanity will be based on the human resources for the future therefore how long we use the potential of everyone for the good to motivate to create uh, should be a better transformation for all of us and as i say the innovation is bringing a new technology new products uh, even for the uh, environment issue and for the uh, green deal in europe it's important to to use all the natural resources to have the e-mobility transition for the better life, which will bring uh, economic growth for the future. On the other side, there's a lot of changes in the healthcare system. It's amazing how during the pandemia we succeed uh, to have vaccines <coughs> and to motivate the people to go out in the right way. We still have to improve the communication with the people. Therefore, innovation, communication, and democratization should be a part of our future. This is briefly for the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. That is a good point. We will address and come back to the three words you use, innovation and uh, the communication and democratization, as you say. It's a three pillars of what you think Will be so. I'll get back to you with another question right now. I want to move on to Jayanta Padar. So, Jayanta, uh, are there any business risks in this reimagination model? Uh, you know what we are talking about, and if yes, uh, what are these risks that we are talking about? Okay, thanks. Thank you, Neeraj. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, definitely, you know when we are talking about uh, reimagining uh, business model, basically it's a new business model. Uh, what you have been doing for so long, you are changing that business model. So certainly there are risks involved. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we will not reimagine or we will not change it. So we need to tackle those risks. Now, uh, the risk depends on a uh, business to business, whether you are in, you know, uh, in the service industry, whether you are in a manufacturing industry. It all depends. You know, uh, they're having a, a, a very different issues. But if you look at Overall, there are a few common risks. What are those common risks? So there are two, three very important common risks. Number one, what is the most important risk in my view? That is the you know impact of your data. Means you know when are you changing the business model? You know you having you are you may be having a lot of uh, money stuck in the market, which is the in in, in regular business what we we, we say the data. Now, once uh, the, your business partner, if they uh, understand or if your bu new business model is such where you are avoiding the existing business partners, then it may be a very difficult task to recover those money from the market. It's, it's a very difficult task, irrespective of whether you are in you know, Asia, whether it is in Europe, where, you know, wherever you are, because the stakeholders, if they, they think that they are not with you, then, then the, your money is stuck and there could be a huge monetary loss. So that is the most important part for us, the business risk is concerned uh, when you are changing the business model. Point number one. Point number two, any social impact. When I think in a social impact, now when are you changing your model? Then the, the important is that how you are perceived by your customer. There are a lot of instances we have seen during this pandemic you know, post pandemic, that people, the businesses are taking advantage of the situation, the pandemic situation. So once if the perception is that, that your company is, is taking advantage of the situation, means uh, I'm saying that so there is no value, there is no social value, then uh, that could be a problem. And that leads to that customer staying away from your business. So you must have must have must be maintaining the social values what 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 you have been maintaining so far and third important point and another most imp important point is is there any impact on environment for example let's say you know in today's business you know, for example a food business you know food delivery business you are delivering food uh, you know household what kind of packaging you are using 
is it you know biodegradable packaging or if it, if it is not is it adding to uh, the environmental hazards or if it is not are you adding you know the carbon footprint are you taking care of carbon footprint when you are changing the uh, business model so this is comes under your environmental impact so if you are talking about the business risk the, there are three important risks common to all business one is the impact of data second is impact of social impact and third is your environmental impact this is the business risk thank you jayant i think you drew some very good good points on that uh i like the uh what is the customer perceive about you are you been credible in this pandemic or are you or you maximize your profits doing that or change whatever so we'll come back to that later thank you for your uh, opening uh teaser points i go to yesper um uh, very different business model uh, you sell a very very uh different social product in the form of a speaker right and and so and in this uh lockdown whatever how has your business changed in the past 12 months uh when people are not able to meet uh, in person right uh, and and how that's a major change it's one of the biggest change we've seen in the world no and i think i think it's been a, a difficult time for us i mean the sound box was in, in, invented as sort of the perfect speaker to bring to a festival so in essence a gathering of 100,000 people and i don't think there's been I don't think we've ever been further from that than we have been in 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 the past 12 months. So so to be honest when the pandemic hit we were sort of scared about how it would affect us. Um but what we tried to go in and 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 do was was to sort of a stay very very close to the customers and and sort of see how did their needs change and how could we sort sort of alter not necessarily our business model per se but more more the way that we sort of position the product to that. So what what we quickly sort of discovered after being in 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 close dialogue with the consumers was that you know even though these like let's say more centralized socialized gatherings such as festivals but it could also be you know nightclubs and things like that um were disappearing the need to be social clearly wasn't um i mean we've seen that with you know digital friday bars and whatever everything happening even just here now on 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 zoom so we thought okay how can we sort of somewhat Cater to that, but that's obviously a bit sort of uh, difficult with when you sell a, a, a loudspeaker. But what we really sort of went out with was actually a message that's very similar to what we're talking about here. We said instead of reimagining business models, we said uh, reimagine summer, and and kind of taking all of the things that you might be missing and then creating them in a new way. So as an example, we were supposed to have the European Championships in football last year, and instead we went out with an ad kind of you know encouraging you to host your own tiny. uh european uh, uh with just you and your very like handful of friends pressing up as each of the individual teams we knew that people were missing festivals we encouraged them to host their own tiny festivals with just their friend like a couple of a handful of friends in their backyard and 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 really just sort of try to still cater to the same use cases but in a reimagined way um and try to you know kind of let's say take advantage of the fact that even though the decent sorry the centralized socializing was gone there was still a big need for socializing and in ma- many ways our product is perfect for sort of decentralized socializing um so we tried to cater to that yes sir that's interesting i uh, never heard of uh, digital friday bars and and that may be a thing that we may want to well today is just tuesday we're still coming away from <laughs> that but uh, hey uh but you know i you draw a very important point and i'm just thinking you know we're all trying to create our own tribe you know worldwide you know similar people coming together creating our own thing self sustained manner so i i i'll get back to that question in a little bit more detail because uh, no matter how much i feel we try to conceive what's going to happen or predict it just turns out with very many surprises right and you know mm-hmm. i wish we had a crystal ball we're all learning uh so good point i think uh the concept of creating tribes and creating your own events uh um uh, around what your interests are is is the future in some ways uh, using digital platforms so thank you for that on that question i'll have some more questions for you in the second round and then i come to e um uh, what are the key changes that you have observed 
uh, since COVID, which is driven by technology because you're a telecommunication, telecom, Deutsche, Marvel Tech. So what are the changes you've seen that has been driven and forced by technology? Uh, if you may want to start with that. Thanks, Narej. It's a very good question. Yeah. In general, I think uh, COVID does not uh, change the way how customer behavior or our way of working is involving. I think it, uh, it's probably largely just accelerated changes. For example, working from home was already existing before COVID, but with the lockdown and uh, limiting mobility, uh, for the company, actually, the best solution to bring the teams together to communicate with customer and supplier is online. So we can see actually a much faster penetration of the collaboration tools. I think the same applies also for e-commerce, for telehealth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So overall, I think uh, the whole pandemic changed the acceleration of the whole digitalization process and the shift of customer behavior into the more digital channels. I think also Julian, Jasper, and uh, Yanada mentioned that all the different aspects, like the communications, like actually the digital technology, all the social aspects there. Yeah. But now probably, because I'm from the telco, yeah, specifically a few impacts uh, I can see change the probably the telco's um, way of thinking driven by technology. The one is probably the pandemic triggers a much greater demand in communications and connectivities. So definitely as a consequence, we can see a much faster rollout of the new network um, infrastructure, like 5 or like 5G. Yeah. Taking 5G as an example, I think um, even end of 2019, uh, 5G, the expectation on 5G rollout was uh, still very moderate. But now we can see actually a fast much faster actually pl rollout plan of the 5G in different countries. Because uh, this is a uh, trigger actually by the demand resulting from the remote uh, working arrangement. People are not really regularly working in the office or in the CBD. But also, like uh, Yule mentioned, uh, healthcare, actually, and uh, water low latency is a very critical requirement to enable the new, uh, new healthcare and use cases. So we can see actually health industry during probably by pandemic, and to accelerate their plan to invest into the network. And here also we can see some interesting approach taking actually, uh, for example, for the 5G rollout, uh, I think the telco players are taking a much more collaborative approach. Here in Singapore, the two smaller telecommunication providers have formed a joint venture to build a joint 5G network and to share it. So there are actually some new thoughts also driven by that. And uh, the second aspect um, I would like also to highlight here is um, with the pandemic, network resilience actually gets much higher attention. And uh, here also, telco players are exploring much stronger the new technologies like uh, network virtualization. So basically putting the traditional, the hardware, the core net component into the cloud. So to create a higher resilience, we can manage the network centrally and less dependent on the first service, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the third aspect is probably less technology driven, but it's on the customer side uh, with the pandemic. I think uh, telcos also start to offering, um, to adapt actually their value proposition. For example, in many countries you can observe, telco are offering relief packages to remove monthly data usage gap or increase that, et cetera, et cetera, to enable a better work from home arrangement, media, and all those. And uh, probably the last um, point I would like to mention here, it's also an important uh, observation, is um, telco, uh, we, we see a much faster adoption of new technologies like internet of things and blockchain, also in the telco industry, but also cross industries. Those technology, I think, um, were more, um, more seen as emerging, but with pandemic and, uh, and the development of those te technologies uh, actually have uh, accelerated in large. Yeah. And, uh, one example you already mentioned is uh, healthcare, and we can see a lot of new innovative uh, solutions emerge to better and faster detect infections, to remotely treat patients, but also in the logistic manufacturing areas, 
we can see a lot of actually combined solution on Internet of Things and blockchain because we have to distribute the, boot, the goods now much faster and also more accurate. Yeah? Yeah. Some countries like Germany use uh, the combined solution on Internet of Things and uh, blockchain to monitor the cold chain um, of uh, vaccine delivery. Yeah. So I think there are a few aspects actually Probably with pandemic, Kotoko suddenly found themselves at the heart of a very fast changing world. And uh, yeah. the impact are often all the different actually sides. And, uh, but uh, to summarize this, it's all to accommodate actually the new customer demand and also to create right. a higher network resilience. Right. So this thank is what the probably industry perspective. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, Yi. You bring out, you know, as they say, life would never be ever again after 5G. So uh, I don't know where you guys will take us. Uh, the whole world is going to go 5G and beyond. So life is never going to be the same ever again. So, yes, thank you very much. Excellent point. So uh, coming back to uh, Dr. Yulian Ivanov, um, since you talked about innovation last time and you just touched upon that, how can you think innovation uh, bring uh, actually economic growth post-COVID? Uh, the growth part of the economic growth using innovation. Thank what you, are your Niraj. some key suggestions or whatever? Yeah. Thank you, Niraj. Uh, I would like to say a few simple uh, points uh, as a comparison from yesterday and for tomorrow. If we start with uh, what uh, mentioned E regarding the five technology, it's already in place uh, in most of the countries in Europe and it's uh, going directly to change the, the thinking, to rethink the work and how to implement the data in the, the daily life. But uh, if we compare what was, uh, let's say, yesterday or in the past, uh, speaking about the innovation, usually we thought about uh, a mission and speaking about for the future, we have to speak about purpose. Therefore, to be more efficient, and to speak from the mission to the purpose. Uh, again, speaking what was uh, in the past, uh, we had the linear um, uh, understanding of the business models for the future. In order to, to be more innovative, we have to take uh, exponential uh, development and exponential uh, way of uh, design. On the other side, uh, if we had in the past uh, to add uh, digital, digital skills, digital implication for the future, we have to put uh, digital as a, on the first place. Uh, speaking about the scalable efficiency in the past, we have to speak about scalable learning. Again, if we compare what was in the past, uh, we were thinking about the assets for the future. It's better to speak for the crowd or how to take a decision in the past. Sometimes we took as an ad hoc, but for the future, on the base of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we can think for algorithm. And this can uh, be um, on the comparison of this different approaches, we can uh, rethink our daily work, re-engineering and redesigning the work through technology reshapes every job. And uh, therefore, uh, speaking on the individual implication, it's better first to engage in lifelong learning or shape your own career part. Or on the third place, I can say, pursue and cultivate the passion. On the institutional implication, it's better to redesign the work for technology and uh, learning or to source and integrate the talent across the network. I already said how important should be the human, human resources for the future. Therefore, to implement new business practices and models uh, should be in place through the right communication and through the right way of doing business. Speaking about the public policy implications, it's better to reimagine uh, lifelong education. 
the education nowadays it's uh, going to be on a crucial point for the development of the human resources and to, to have uh, economic growth. Therefore, the transition support for the income and uh, the health care, it's again on the base of innovation. And uh, the, the last but not the less, it's uh, to, uh, to have the legal reg regulatory policies in place, again, to the right uh, communication and database. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jolien. I think uh, I, as we move forward into the knowledge, knowledge, more deeper knowledge economy, I, I think our, our need to retool ourselves to begin with always and, and also the entire nation and the young millennial across is going to be a huge, huge task because the mindset is wired differently. And the change is so rapid, it sometimes becomes very difficult to adapt to it and accept that this is going to happen. So uh, I'll, I'll come back to you with your key takeaway points later, back to Jayanta. And I know that uh, you know, as we talk about the reimagining uh, of the business model, uh, I don't think it means only digital transformation or, or changes around digital transformation. It is beyond that. If if so if you could throw lights beyond the digital transformation uh, as part of this reimagining the business model, that would be very nice if you can uh, talk something about that part. Well, well, Niraj, uh, you were right. When uh, most of the people, most of us, when they're talking about uh, reimagining the business model or we talk, we talk about a digital transformation, uh, most of us think that it is a technology. If we, we only talk about technology, right? But it is not really technology. Technology is definitely the most important part of the transformation. In today's world, it's all about technology. Tomorrow is technology only. But that is, though, I, as I said, it is the main part of the, uh, uh, the new business model. But your main thing, the entire business will be, you know, standing on three most important things. One is the infrastructure. Second is your uh, your business operation itself, the business orientation. And third, most important thing is your customer experience. Now, your digital transformation has to be evolve all these areas, not only the technology. This is uh, when we are talking about digital transformation. Now, as you ask that, you know, uh, what are the other areas other than digital transformation uh, where uh, an organization, a company should focus on? Uh, in my view, there are a few areas where uh, digital transformation obviously is there. That is the you know, primary objective. But uh, you must focus on three or four strategic areas. Uh, the first most important area for all business anywhere in the world is recovering your revenue, whatever you have lost. As you need to say that uh, from you know, struggling to thriving or something like that. So most important thing is how to recover the businesses right now how you recover the businesses if you uh, go like the normal way you have been going uh, it uh, you you may find it difficult so you need to have a, a different approach when i say different approach it's maybe a approach like a startup so when i say that approach like a startup a startup what is a startup approach it's action action and action only so initially they focus on revenue they don't look at anything else what is the process you know you know what is the you know effect and all these things that comes later on first you gathered revenue first you sell your product first you sell your service and 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 gather the revenue so that is most important to recover your revenue that is the main challenge in fact for a leader you know bring back revenue is the most toughest challenge in today's scenario Second is that, you know, adoption of your new ecosystem. Now, when I say new ecosystem in COVID or post-COVID era, in all about the mainly all about the supply chain. Now, how you are adopting the new supply chain? Now, see, new supply chain, it cannot be a global supply chain now. It has to be a local supply chain. Now, if you think about a global supply chain, that global supply chain will not be able to deliver what you want in post-COVID era. 
second point is you know when we are talking about that you know recovering the revenue now you cannot recover revenue unless until you rebuild your operation now how you rebuild your operation again the main thing you revolve with your supply chain now as i said that there is no global supply chain now the supply chain is now become regional from regional this is not even national supply chain it's an absolutely local supply chain right local supply chain means the people who are involved in your you know the, the partner if your supply chain partner they need to know the local they need to know the local address they need to know the zip code properly so that they can deliver things faster right so that's why you need absolute you know local partner where so far your supply chain is concerned and when you are talking about the rebuilding operation your another important point is the future of work now when i say future of work now everybody we are we are now accustomed with work from home but it's not really work from home work from anywhere in fact why home basically you are talking about work remotely working remotely you are adding value you are doing whatever you want to do whatever you are supposed to do working remotely it may not be necessary from work from home and today's scenario if you take the statistics in case of the sales also almost the you know the same percentage of people they are saying that they have not not lost any business working remotely they are able to connect with their customer and able to deliver the result to their company so this is we are talking about rebuilding operation now why you are talking about rebuilding i am going backward basically then how you can rebuild operation to rebuild operation you have to rebuild your organization now when you are changing a business model means you are changing everything your organization entire process starting from people your hr your manufacturing everything is depends on your business model how you are selling your product right everything everything evolves on that your system process entire infrastructure of the company everything depends on that now when you are changing that when you are reimagining that so you have to reimagining everything you have to get everything around that business model surrounding this business model so that is most unless until we need to do that then whatever good your business model is if your organization is not supporting that business model if you are not able to rethink your your organization you have to rethink your organization your business model your re, your reimagining of business model will not be any help and lastly obviously the digitization you have to accelerate it you have to accelerate it to to whatever you know you know you can do it now it's the, there is no time that okay fine we will wait we will see today there is no time of waiting there is no time of see you have to accelerate everything to get the desired result so if you ask me to summarize it that what are the other way of digitization to what are the uh, other areas most important strategic areas i would say it's recovering your revenue you are rebuilding your operation rethinking your organization and accelerate your digital transformation that's all okay thank you jayanta because uh, i think uh, you reminded us all that not all of us uh, is in are in the business of technology we use technology for our businesses otherwise there is a very clear oh everything is about yes you adapt technology to i, I think i can see your entrepreneurship come across because you're talking about real hands on challenges as we face today and it's not out of our business school model it's what you experience thank you for bringing that insight uh, let me get to yesper uh and you know one of the biggest uh, survey that people might want to have and pay for would be um, how has the consumer behavior changed since the pandemic came over last year in in march you know because that's that is key to the entire world that we are talking about what are the changes you see yesper absolutely and how it impact No sure and I think I think I mean I think there's many ways that consumer behavior has changed. I think we've just touched upon it in in some ways of course sort of like e-commerce has gone up and and in general sort of yeah everything online has gone up but what I think is more interesting to look at and what I think we have to be aware of is sort of more let's say the, the spending patterns of 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 consumers because I think in general when sort of covid hit last year everyone was scared that the economy was going to go to shit um so so people stopped spending um a lot of people lost their jobs 
Um, then we started, like practically all governments started running a super like expensive fiscal policy and started pumping stimulus out, which meant that a lot more people could keep their jobs and got, got their jobs and, and like, basically the markets went up and, and also people just got stimulus checks. And I think that combined with the fact that they were staying home and basically like didn't use their discretionary spend for what they would regularly spend their discretionary spend on which was, you know, restaurants, traveling, all that kind of stuff, led them led to a pretty significant increase in, in a lot of sort of other, you know, spend. And that could be everything from remodeling of home to consumer electronics, where we've seen a massive increase in, um, in demand simply because people have had, you know, excess money to spend and have wanted to have some fun at home. Um, and I think what's going to be really interesting to see is sort of, how will that change now that sort of let's say COVID is 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 hopefully nearing its end, at least as a as a global pandemic kind of thing, and and thereby also that the stimulus ends and 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 also with the markets doing what 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 they do right now, and I think we might be in many businesses seeing sort of let's say like being in somewhat of an artificial demand bubble right now, and 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 I don't know how that's going to change in the past, past, next coming six or twelve months. Okay, thank you, Esper. I think that's important. Uh to try and get an idea of what's going to happen because all our business model that we are trying to rebuild or reimagine is about a forecasted consumer behavior mm. of supply and demand and how will that work. Um, uh, uh, let me get back to you. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, because we have just about seven, eight minutes, so we'll, I'll, I'll get two minutes of your response, then we get back to okay. some key takeaways and we close that. So, um, how do you see the post, uh, the future development post this pandemic? We're going to see the long tail of the pandemic. Uh, what are the long lasting impacts in your telecommunication industry? I'm talking beyond COVID and going long term. What could be our uh, long term impact if you see? And thanks, Mary. This is um, actually a very good question. And maybe I just share a few aspects, I think, uh, to hoping that you should pay attention to post-COVID. And let me just uh, start with, uh, get back to the sentence uh, Janata just shared. Digital transformation is not about technology. I think this is also 100% true for the telecom industry. The aspect the telecom industry has to pay attention is not technology. So probably I start uh, with the customer side. I think uh, telcos have already taken some proactive steps during the pandemic, like the relief package, etc. And uh, but uh, long term, I think uh, many of those changed customer behavior will stay there, like hybrid working models and uh, more home entertainment and uh, cloud computing, etc. So I think the customer requirements is changing also from just pure the speed to more liability, uh, reliability and uh, data security and uh, all those. So I think uh, for telcos. Uh, after the post-COVID or long term, she also pay more attention. It's also an opportunity to shape their product service proposition around that to offer more value to the customer. And uh, on the customer side, I think another also important aspect is how to better help SMEs in the whole digital transformation process. Because I think uh, for SME, there's still a huge challenge to do the transformation due to actually the lack of knowledge, the high investment cost. And uh, Telco can take this as opportunity also to reshape their value proposition, include actually more relevant services, but more importantly also to help SME, SMEs on the whole journey to give them more education on that. So this is uh, probably one aspect from the customer side. And the second aspect, uh, I mentioned the uh, network resilience. I think this is, uh, is going to take many years, like the transformation into the virtualized network. But there are also other aspects uh, like uh, the digital capabilities, not only on the customer end to provide each channel, et cetera, but also as Janata mentioned, is the, the entire actually backend process across all the different functions. And uh, also the supply chain is uh, an important aspect, how to create higher resilience, maybe the regional supply chain. So I think uh, for telco, um, the development, uh, the future network development plan is uh, is actually has to consider many aspects, not just the traditional the capex driven approach. Yeah. 
And um, the third aspect, um, I think is also very important, probably most important is, is actually the sustainability. Because uh, telecommunication providers are actually one of the biggest consum- uh, energy consumers. Yeah? And now with all those accelerated network rollout and also more demand at the data center, I think telco players can play a very, very key role to shape and also to drive the green energy the innovations. Yeah? So I think uh, the carbon neutrality should be also part of um, actually the key criteria in the strategic decision making process for the telcos. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, maybe just quickly the last one. I think overall, all those points uh, very key for the telco is actually changing the mindset to taking a more coll- collective approach. This is not about building all the service and products single-handedly. It's more. Ex-